center in the CHR. Good morning. Thanks, Nicole. Which is the center for uh, faculty of environment, earth, and resources. I am the data manager for the Canadian Watershed Information Network and the program manager and researcher within the Manitoba Great Lakes program. I co chair this group with Nicole Wilson, who's also on this call. In this virtual format, we are all coming from different locations. And I want to acknowledge that I am located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. In the theme of today's panel, I also want to acknowledge that my drinking water comes from Shoal Lake through the Winnipeg Aqueduct, which was constructed in 1919 at the expense of the Shoal Lake 40 First Nations Water Security. And I invite you all to let us know in the chat what territory you're coming from. So today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Merle Ballard, who's presenting on water, friend or foe, examining the historical aquatic relationship of the Anishinaabe at Lake St. Martin. Uh, but before we begin, I'll just go through some logistics. So we have enabled the closed captioning, as I mentioned earlier. So please feel free to turn that on as you need. Please remember to keep yourself muted during the presentation. And we will be recording the event and hosting it on our U of M Sustainability YouTube, which I'll put in the chat, the link in the chat. Our first two talks are on there already. And the presentation will be approximately 30 minutes. I will give Merle a round of five minute warning. There will be a Q&A period at the end and that Q&A period is not recorded. So feel free to put questions in the chat or use the, Oh, we don't have a Q&A box, so just do the, the chat is good. Or raise your hand and we will be monitoring to make sure that we don't miss anyone. And I'd like to say that for anybody who's interested to learn more about our working group, I will also put the link to our website on in the chat. And there you can find a list of the next uh, speakers in our series. So we've already started recording. So as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Merle Ballard's presenting today. And Dr. Ballard is the Director of the New Indigenous Science Division at Environment and Climate Change Canada and an Assistant Professor and Indigenous Scholar in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Manitoba. Anishinaabe from Lake St. Martin, First Nation, Dr. Ballard's latest research explores how her fluency in Anishinaabe, Moen, can transform approaches to water resource management using baseline monitors. Dr. Ballard also serves on a number of committees and currently holds prestigious NSERC, so Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and SEER, which is the Canadian Institute for Health Research Grants. Her other research interests include, but are not limited to, climate, species at risk, sustainability, and the politics of flooding displacement. So I'll just send Merle a message to present. And we are very pleased to see you, Merle. Can you allow me to share the screen? Yes. You should be a co-host. Okay. Uh, hold on. Sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. I'm trying to get it uh, to start from the front here, but the, uh, but the things are in the way. Hold on. Sorry about that. Shoot. Okay, I'm gonna to have to go on. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, my name is Merle Ballard, and I'm gonna be talking about uh, water or the relationship of, with water of indigenous peoples and um, and water uh, regarding the relationship uh, between aquatics and Anishinaabe, Lake St. Martin. I'm gonna be taking be talking about the lake itself, Lake Martin, and uh, the relationship that the First Nations uh, people have. Uh, but 
uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge where I am. I'm in a Treaty 1 territory uh, located in Winnipeg right now. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the lands that I'm on. Um, So I'm going to be talking about um, Lakes Martin. I'm going to give an introduction, a little bit of, of the background and uh, the relationship of the lake with Anishinaabeg in the area and uh, the way it was then and the way it is now. And then I'm going to give a summary and a conclusion. Uh, Lakes Martin is uh, located uh, between uh, Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg. Big. Uh, Lake Martin has a north basin and a south basin, and it's uh, divided uh, by a narrow region called the Narrows. And uh, there's uh, three communities uh, directly located on the north so shore of the south basin of Lake Martin. And uh, these are Lake Martin First Nation, uh, Little Saskatchewan First Nation, and Penemotang First Nation. And uh, further down at the end of Dauphin River is uh, the Dauphin River First Nation, uh, which is located at the mouth of Lake Winnipeg. And uh, the Anishinaabeg have lived uh, lived around the Lakes and Martin for a long time, where they've had uh, sustainable lives, uh, uh, which were based on uh, the natural law. And uh, since 1960, there's been water control structures that were put in place uh, to the mouth of uh, the Fayford River, which goes into Lake St. Martin. And uh, there's a talk is about um, goal number six regarding a sustainable water management. Uh, this is a map of Manitoba and uh, you can see the circle uh, right in uh, the southern side of the province, I guess, one third of the way up. Uh, that's where uh, where Lake St. Martin is. So you can see it on uh, the right side of the screen, uh, the lake itself, uh, where I talk about uh, the North Basin and uh, the South Basin. Uh, Lake St. Martin was formed uh, by a meteor about uh, 200 million years ago, approximately 200 a million years ago, and uh, you can see uh, there is a unique rocks around the Lake St. Martin area. If you ever go there, there's a lot of um, uh, rock structure, kind of uh, little hills uh, that are that are made of rocks, and uh, this is uh, the remnant of uh, the meteor that uh, struck there, and that uh, the meteor struck uh, left a massive hole, a circular hole around where the lake is and around a surrounding area. It's really beautiful area. And uh, there's a different rocks uh, that are found within the area that are not found, that are not found in uh, different parts of the province. Uh, the Lake Winnipeg watershed that feeds into Lake St. Martin. Uh, the watershed that comes from uh, the west of us, uh, from Alberta, from the Rockies, and then it uh, drains into Saskatchewan, across the Saskatchewan, and then into Manitoba, and into uh, uh, Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin, and Lake Winnipeg. And it's approximately, there's approximately uh, 7 million people uh, that live around the watershed. And most of these are the larger cities like Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Regina, Winnipeg, and Fargo in the US. And there's a lot of agricultural land use, which means that uh, there's gonna be a runoff that are going into the lake as well, uh, 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 which is a result of the agricultural land use. The western part of the watershed is a predominantly cropland, and the eastern part, uh, which is where most of the indigenous peoples live, is mostly uh, the boreal sh shield region. And there is um, three major Winnipeg, uh, three major rivers that are feeding into Lake Winnipeg: the Saskatchewan, Red, and uh, the Winnipeg rivers. 
and uh, this is uh, this is a rough um, boundary of the watershed. When you look at this uh, watershed, the watershed resembles uh, closely uh, with uh, the treaty areas, uh, the number of the treaty areas of uh, Western Western Canada. Uh, from uh, Treaty 1 to 11, uh, they resemble closely. So that signifies that the First Nation people had a unique relationship with the water from way back. And uh, the watershed it goes into um, the um, uh, the eastern part of uh, Lake Superior as well, uh, which is on the right of the screen. Sorry, I can't figure out which direction, left, right, east, west. The people of the Lake St. Martin uh, came from uh, the Sault Ste. Marie area. This was a long time ago, probably a hundred, a couple hundred years ago, 300 years ago. So, and uh, they settled in what is known as Lake St. Martin. And uh, the people are Ojibwe, uh, which, uh, which are also referred to as uh, the Soto people. And uh, when the Ojibwe people are part of uh, the Chippewa well, people which are uh, found in the US and the north, the northeast woodlands, which is uh, southern and uh, central Ontario today. Uh, the people of Lake St. Martin uh, know their history and uh, they talk about uh, where the people came from and uh, where they traveled to get to where they are. We refer to as water as Nibé. Uh, we spell it uh, with a B, uh, that's N-I-B-I, -I because of uh, the dialect in our area, that's the way we pronounce it. There's a different pronunciation is uh, pronounced Nibé as well with a P, but we say Nibé. And uh, we, and the people, and the First Nations, uh, who had a close relationship with the water, thought of it as a friend. It was a friend because we all know that water is life. The natural law of the water uh, before the interruption and before uh, dams are built, before it uh, starts getting diverted, at, diverted uh, that's a natural law. So the people in the area know that uh, the land floods naturally and uh, the people know that the flood that there's flood that there's flood natural floods occurring about approximately every 50 years and uh, this is natural they know that there's natural flows of the water like uh, going into the lakes uh, they have a special they have a specific names for the way the water flows when it's when it's in when the water flows in its natural state. Uh, when uh, the elders of the area talk about uh, the flooding, uh, they share stories of how they used to leave the land when it was flooded, uh, just to simply uh, relocate at a different part of land. And uh, they let the waters flood and uh, they talk about um, how the land was uh, rejuvenating itself when they came back to the land after the water receded from the flood, they shared the stories of that the land was uh, renewed, fresh. There was, was a new growth on the land. And this is an, the natural process that this is a part of the natural law. The, another thing about the lake itself is it has um, the North Basin and the South Basin. The North Basin is naturally um, uh, lower than in the South Basin. And the North Basin is uh, just a few feet deep, but probably at the max of six feet deep. Whereas uh, the South Basin is much deeper. The narrows that uh, separate these uh, two regions, um, uh, the elders talk about how they used to cross their 
the cradle from uh, the south basin to the other side, uh, to the other side, uh, through the narrows, because of the narrows was um, was a region and that was uh, narrow and uh, didn't have that much water and uh, the cattle used to walk across a swim walk, but it wasn't, uh, the current wasn't, wasn't uh, strong enough for the cattle to drown or else uh, to drift away. They also talk about uh, the Narrows region as uh, the kidney of the lake because this is where the filtering process uh, takes place. And uh, this is part of the natural law. Most of the lakes, they have a narrow part and uh, that's a natural filter of the lake. The relationship uh, between uh, the Anishinaabeg and uh, the lake itself are based on uh, the social, cultural, spiritual, traditional, economic, and uh, defense activities. And the land is really important uh, for the Anishinaabeg of the region and uh, the land and the water go together. They talk about uh, they talk about uh, the way they used to interact uh, with the water. Water is important uh, for people's health. When uh, the pe people are uh, used to be on the land, uh, they would just get their water wherever they can for the night. Uh, they would use a stick and um, go around uh, the area, and uh, the stick would uh, start shaking, and that's where the water was. So they would just. Uh, And uh, they had to go across, and uh, they didn't have motors, and uh, they didn't want to. They didn't want to paddle across. They would just build a sail, and uh, the wind would wind would carry them across uh, from uh, one shore to the other. Uh, they did a lot of uh, they did a lot of activities. Uh, fishing uh, was a main activity, a sustainable activity. Uh, there was a lot of agriculture where there was a lot of cattle, a lot of people uh, used to have cattle, uh, just about every family uh, used to have cattle. And uh, recreational activities used to, take, uh, used to take part on the lake, uh, where there were, uh, were skating, uh, swimming for the children. Uh, the women uh, talked about, um, going to the lake and uh, to do their laundry. And uh, they would spend the whole day at the lake, uh, take their whole families and just um, make a day out of it. And uh, there used to be a lot of uh, trees along the shoreline and natural trees, a natural shoreline. And they got their food. They fought their battles uh, too on the lake because uh, they had to defend uh, their lands. Uh, they would have to uh, fight off uh, tribes that that uh, tried to take over their lands uh, from the south. Uh, these were the Sioux people, so they got into fat battles, and uh, the lake was where uh, they did a lot of their battles, and uh, the lake was where uh, the water was where uh, they um, they navigated, where they plotted uh, their defense. There was a different uses as well of the lake uh, for the men, uh, women, and the children. Okay, I'm very cognizant of the time here, so I'm uh, going pretty fast. Sorry about that. We have uh, we have a relationship with water uh, as Indigenous people, so we have a special relationship with water. And as a people too, in general, uh, we have uh, we have uh, water in our bodies where without water, uh, we wouldn't be here, uh, we would perish. So water is very important. And uh, Nibi, Nibi was free. Now a lot of people would drink bottled water, it's no longer free. And uh, Nibi is alive too. Uh, if you take out uh, the oxygen from the water, the water would die, it wouldn't be alive. And the way uh, the indigenous people uh, referred, referred to water too, that it has, that it has personhood. 
And there's a lot of uh, stories that were shared with me regarding Lake St. Martin, uh, the lake itself, uh, the way we have to respect it. I uh, was told uh, growing up, uh, be, be scared of water, because if you're not scared of water, if uh, you fool around with water, uh, water will kill you. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge regarding Lake St. Martin, the north and the south basin, uh, the way the water is, uh, uh, where the currents are and uh, where the natural flows are, where the natural springs are, uh, where the fish spawn. And there's a different forms of uh, water too that was used. Uh, the ice was taken uh, during the spring and uh, brought to the households and to be used during the summer to cool off. Uh, to cool off uh, the meat, for example, the fish, etc., And uh, snow was also used for uh, drinking water. There's a different consistency. There's a different consistencies that are used for snow. Like there's a top, uh, middle. There's a certain uh, texture that you have to use for drinking. And uh, these are the knowledges regarding uh, the water that are passed on uh, whether natural where the natural springs are uh, located uh, throughout the lake too. Uh, there's a spot on the lake that never freeze and uh, the people know where these, these uh, spots are, these are the natural springs. Right. And the people, uh, the people will know about uh, the water, the way it behaves, and they know when uh, when a storm is coming by the way the water looks and sounds. And there's a different uh, stories that there, there's a different uh, things about the lake that are passed on, and uh, that is a science because the people know the area; they know exactly the way the water is. We're taught about the ethics of water, uh, the way we have to respect water, the way um, water is uh, given a personhood. Uh, um, they, uh, we're taught that water is powerful, that uh, because a lot of uh, people too, they have uh, drowned within the lakes within uh, the waters of Lake St. Martin, there's a uh, certain areas that are more turbulent and than the others. And so this is part of the, the teachings that were also taught that um, water can be mischievous. Uh, we have to respect it because if we don't respect it, it's going to do something to us. My mama was always uh, sharing this stories with me uh, regarding water. Meaning that water is very mischievous. It can get into a crack and uh, start multiplying from there, and uh, from there, and there can be other things uh, such as mold growing. So the question that we ask uh, regarding water is: uh, water our friend or foe? It used to be our friend. I mean, this is a picture of my mother. This is my mother's house uh, in the old Lake St. Martin where I grew up. Uh, she told me to take a picture of her in front of her house. This was taken about uh, about a 2000, I think, uh, uh, the early 2000s. And my mom is not the type uh, to pose for pictures. Like uh, she never wants me to take a picture of her. But uh, she told me to take a picture of her in front of uh, uh, her house. Uh, my mom was the kind of person who used to take a pride in her yard, always growing gardens, flowers, uh, planting trees around her yard. So this was her yard. She has a really beautiful yard. And uh, this was where uh, the water was. This, uh, this contained uh, the water tank where the water was filled the cistern. And then uh, where it been now, the relationship of Lake St. Martin uh, with, uh, with the people, water and people now. 
uh, the manipulation of uh, water levels that uh, goes against uh, the natural laws. Uh, the natural laws were taught uh, the way we're supposed to treat water, the way um, water is uh, supposed to be natural, like uh, the natural state of the lakes, the natural state of the rivers, the way the the fluid. That's a natural law, the way they were designed to function. In 1961, uh, the Fairford Dam uh, was operational. Uh, the Fairford Dam is on uh, the left of the screen. And in 1970, uh, the Portage Diversion was built. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, what has become of Lake St. Martin because of these uh, two water control structures, uh, Lake St. Martin uh, has become a holding tank for the waters coming in from uh, the rivers, the watershed, and uh, Lake Winnipeg itself. These are two physical lakes, uh, Lake Winnipeg and Lake, and, and the Lake Manitoba. And the Lake St. Martin bears the excess water from uh, the watershed. The natural law has been broken. We talk about uh, sustainable water management. So is a uh, sustainable water management in place? And if it is, uh, for whom? Sorry, hold on. Yeah. In uh, 2011, uh, Lake St. Martin was flooded out. Uh, the province had declared the Emergency Measures Act, uh, which is an act that is declared whenever uh, there's a something that's going to impact the public and then the Emergency Measures Act is declared uh, to alleviate that uh, to give a certain people's power to deal with an emergency. And the Water Rights Act as well uh, refers to the water control works, water uses and the version. So the question about these, uh, this is for water, do we ever ask water what the water wants? Uh, do we ever ask water how it's going to treat the people that use it for their lives, livelihoods? And the relationship uh, with water then and now may be so mischievous and the water is going against us because we haven't uh, treated it right. We have a moose gun which means floods now. We have a lot of floods. Uh, Lake St. Martin has been uh, flooded repeatedly since uh, the first water control structure was built in 19 1960. So the people in the area know that the water, the water comes and it goes back, it comes and it goes back. And what this means that uh, throughout the years, uh, the land that they used to use for grazing cattle, for making hay, uh, that, that disappeared, that disappeared, and that the landscape uh, where it used to be hay was replaced by um, by water plants such as uh, reeds, bulrushes, and it's become swampy now. It's it's no longer uh, the sustainable land uh, that they used to that they used to sustain the people and uh, you could drink up from uh, the wells before and now you can't drink from the wells and in uh, 2011 uh, the super flood happened where the emergencies where the emergency management act was enacted so nibi a friend of fru in 2017, I hosted a workshop with the elders from the Interlake region. Uh, there was approximately 200, 200 in attendance. So there was lots of people there. And one of the comments that just was made was unless you stop the water, that's the only way to heal because water has uh, caused a lot of uh, grief, trauma, death, everything you could think of uh, because of the flood, uh, the flood from 2011 and uh, the past floods that have occurred. 
when uh, when water becomes for when water becomes an enemy, this is because of the artificial flooding at 60 plus years, where the natural law is compromised, where Nibi, which is life, has a turn against the First Nations, uh, the sustainable livelihoods and disappeared. And now it's a matter of uh, Pimatisi, is now a matter of uh, Pimatisi. Pimadisivin and Pimadisivin. Now, those are these are different concepts. Uh, Pimadisivin means uh, what you do to live. Pimadisivin means what you are doing about your person, your being, your life. These are water levels from uh, 1961 uh, to 2011. These uh, what these uh, levels show is uh, they don't uh, depict uh, what happened, uh, what happened on the ground level with what the elders know. The waters don't show that uh, there's a minimum water, uh, water level increases. But in reality, uh, the constant flooding that has occurred uh, from the 1960s right up to the present is not captured because uh, the oral the, what's happening on the land with the people, what's happening uh, with the changes uh, that occur uh, with the land, with the waters. They're not uh, depicted there. And uh, you can tell in uh, 2011, and that's uh, the super flood where the waters were really high. This is, uh, these are some of the pictures uh, my mom's house, which I showed you, which is on the bottom uh, left hand of the screen. And uh, the super flood of 2011, now you can see uh, the square that's kind of at the center of the picture. That was my mom's house. So that's the house I grew up in. And uh, 2011, uh, the top uh, left hand of the screen, uh, that's a flood that was in the spring. And then in 2011, and that was um, made the summer when uh, the flood got really bad. And uh, the bottom left hand of the screen is uh, July 2018. The water came far where the natural shoreline was uh, that completely disappeared. Uh, the trees are all gone now on the natural shoreline. You won't see any more trees anywhere. And where my mom's house used to be, uh, it's gone now, it doesn't exist anymore. So uh, the traditional lands where I grew up in uh, don't exist anymore because of uh, flooding. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is the one I talked about, the, the narrows of the kidney between uh, uh, north, the north and the south basin. The, the people used to take their cattle across from uh, the north side where the people live uh, to the south side uh, where the cattle used to go spend the summers. And uh, the Narrows was narrow. That's why it was called the Narrows. Now it's about uh, three times its original size because of the constant flooding of the Lake Lake St. Martin. Uh, this uh, this picture here and depicts where the trees were. Uh, there used to be a beach, a really nice beach. It was all sand, and uh, we used to have uh, we used to have a baseball diamonds here, a recreational area. I don't know if you can see where my where the cursor is, but on the left hand of the screen where the water is above uh, the highway where they built the dike. And the highways here, this is where the province built the dikes uh, to keep the water out. So they destroyed the whole community in order to keep the water out. And the, the reason uh, they sacrificed uh, the downstream users was uh, diverting the water into Lake St. Martin. I don't know why they didn't uh, divert it to different parts, but, uh, but the downstream 
and the downstream, uh, the downstream of the Fairford Dam is where the First Nations people live. And of course, uh, we know this that the First Nation Indigenous peoples are usually sacrificed uh, for the benefit of others. Uh, this was taken in uh, 2020. Uh, the elders talk about these trees. They say that uh, the trees are rotting from underneath. Their roots are rotting because of the excess water that's coming up uh, from the ground table because Aix and Martin is now becoming a holding tank. So uh, there's a lot of uh, rotting trees that are that are throughout this area around Lakes and Martin. And the first displacement uh, made the community to relocate from the old Lakes and Martin, where I showed a picture, uh, to a completely new area uh, where they built homes. And uh, there's a lot of problems with this. And they started from scratch. So there's a few pluses, but uh, the, for example, uh, they now have a fire hydrants, and they have uh, now have uh, they now have uh, they now have uh, piped water street signs. But the argument about this is First Nations uh, sh should all have these uh, to begin with in the first place. Like they all should have a piped water anyways, and they all should have uh, water hydrants. They should have uh, signs, but. But if you go to a First Nation community, chances are you're not going to see uh, fire hydrants or piped water, street signs. Uh, this was taken at 2020, and this is uh, the new community of Lake Smart and Lake Martin First Nation after uh, uh, the waters from the lake, uh, the lake proper itself flooded and and the people were, were forced displaced and uh, the old community completely destroyed where they had no choice but uh, to, uh, to be relocated physically into another part of land. And you can see that it's very different from the old community. It looks like a little town now with a very small space and uh, there's, there's nowhere to grow. Uh, this was taken last year. We went out on the lake to take some samples, and uh, this was taken uh, in October. And uh, this is the middle of the lake. I'm just going to show you. I'm hoping it. Okay. We got stuck in the middle of the lake because the water is so shallow, and we had. To, uh, we had to use uh, we had to use uh, paddles to get out. It's very sandy, muddy. You can see there, and that destroys uh, the motors or the motors that are on the boat. And uh, the lake is like that. It's very shallow in some parts because of the manipulation of the water levels. So, in summary, uh, water is. Uh, water is an enemy now for the people that live around the Lakes and Martin. The Pimachuan is gone. Uh, the sustainable uh, livelihoods has gone. Land has changed. Uh, gardening, uh, where a lot of people used to have gardens, farms, uh, those are all gone now. Um, and the people uh, were gone from the land the seven years, and uh, during that, uh, the, uh, the seven years, a lot of uh, people died. The people are not well, and the education system was impacted. The children that were away, their education got interrupted. There's a lot of uh, social problems because uh, the people coming back, they didn't know one another. They didn't have that, that social fabric for them uh, to know themselves as a community. When they came back, they came back with a lifestyle that's associated with a larger city. For example, there's a lot of uh, 
drugs and violence. So there's a lot of that. The cultural activities were lost. The traditional, recreational, spiritual, economic, and be mad And I'm just going to go over these really fast because of lack of times. And so in conclusion, uh, we have a relationship with water. Water is life. Water should be life, but but water was a turn against uh, the First Nations living around Lake St. Martin and now water, water is their enemy. And the Pimachu, the Pimachu is gone. The question I'm gonna pose to you regarding water and do we ever ask the bee what it wants? Do we ever ask the lakes that are the water, the rivers, streams, uh, what do you want? And do you wanna be manipulated? Do you wanna be diverted? We never ask that question. So you should ask, we should ask water what it wants before we do something to it. And these are some of my references that I used and my contact information. Thank you, Merle. That was great. Um, so I'm going to stop recording, if I can. I might... Um...